Corinthians chapter 15, if you will. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Do a few minutes here of review, get our minds where we've been looking here as we come as we continue the study in, in uh, you, the real you. And uh, this is an issue. Did I go away? Okay, just making sure. Just making sure. <laughs> where am I? I don't know. Where are you? <laughs> hey, is this thing on? <laughs> yes. So anyway, just uh, real quick here, just uh, so a, a review, if you will, in, in what we've looked at over the last eight weeks. Uh, ten weeks ago, we had an event that happened here in our church family that was rather devastating, and it set us on a course of thinking about, and it, me on a course, and thus you with me, of thinking about and considering uh, you and the makeup of you and how you, f- how you work and function and and, and so forth. So we began by seeing the issue of the makeup of man and how God created man. And he created man with a spirit, a soul, and a body. And, and we studied out those details. And, and then, then we saw that, there, that not only did God create man that way, but then yet in his, by, in his word, he created an edification process, which is designed to build into the spirit the, the issue of and I got to write. I was really going to try not to write on the board today, but it's just not going to work. So when God made, made man in a spirit, okay, and he made us a soul, and that makes up our inner man, and then we have the issue of our body. When, when God made man this way, he did it for a reason. In, in your spirit, this is, this is your mind. All right, let's just get all this up there. Here's your heart, okay? We'll call this your will, your volition, that in, sits in your heart. That's, your heart is the mentality of your soul. The, the, the link between your spirit and your soul is in your thinking, it's in your mind. And uh, you have the issue of your conscience, and then you have the issue of your emotions. Your body, that's the vehicle in which you tote everything around. That's this guy, the flesh, Okay. And we, we, when we're looking at the vehicle, there are systems and source, resources that are in place there that your body has. Your body also has emotions. And the connection between your inner man and your body is in the emotions. And, and that's, where, that's where trouble begins to brew. Okay, So God, over here, God is a spirit. John says that we worship God in spirit and in truth. So if we're going to talk to God, we have to be, we have to have his spirit. That's where we're going to talk with God. Also over here, we talk to people. That's in our spirit as well. That's our communication process. That's where human viewpoint begins to to fetter into the equation. And when God set up and he said, okay, we're going to have we're going to make man this way. I'm going to then write my book in a manner, my word, that I'm going to develop inside of this guy some norms and standards based on sound doctrine and a godly edification process. And that's really in lesson two what we looked at. It's really in our Sunday school lesson hour. We did it in our thinking here. And in our thinking processes, we're going to build in some sound doctrine. We're going to build in the issue of grace, and we're going to build in the issue of the church, and we're going to and, and the cross and everything. And we're going to build up this edification process in, in, of sound doctrine, so that we have a norms and standards, so that when things in life happen, the heart and the mind are working together. They're looking at that set of norms and standards. Now, your human viewpoint, your mom and dad, the people you run with, your friends, your peer pressure, they build into you also norms and standards. But their viewpoint is human viewpoint. This is divine viewpoint. So we have, then we begin to look at the issue there of some things that are happening here. Then we spend a, sun, a service looking at, a study looking at the issue of our emotions and the fact that your emotions are responders. They're foolish, they're stupid, they're dumb, they're ignorant. They have no ability to make a decision on their own, if you will. They're designed to respond to what your heart and what your will and so forth has 
figured out we're going to do. Your conscience looks at that and, and accuses or excuses your activity. They are evaluators. Is what your body doing out over here because your emotions, your heart makes a decision based on one of the two norms and standards. Okay? Hopefully as believers, and by the way, this is all believers. If this was unbelievers, we're, we're talking about it. Your spirit's darkened. Your spirit, your soul is dead, and your body's depraved. So instead of working this way, left to right, we're working backwards, okay? Now, we're not talking about unsaved people because you're not unsaved people that we're dealing with. I need you to understand how you're working. In your emotions, emotions, that's what makes the activity of the body go, which then produces the good works, we hope, okay? Now, if you're operating on human viewpoint, by the way, could human viewpoint also be good? Sure, it can be good. You know, moral and helping and helping out. You know, the book tells you to do it too, but mom and dad probably drilled it into your head. If not them, then the Boy Scouts did or the Girl Scouts, you know. <laughs> we always be, you know. <laughs> anyway, you can run across here like this. Then we looked at the issue of your emotions. And that they respond, they're the responders. We looked at the issue that your three critical areas of you are your heart and your mind and, and your, your will and your emotions. The mind being filled with the truth. By the way, the default for a believer is always faith. That was in our third or fourth lesson we did. Fourth lesson, I believe. The default is always Faith for a believer, no matter what is going on, that ought to be your default. So you have a mind filled with truth, you have a heart or your will where you're making a choice on the truth in your mind, and then your emotions, they respond to that decision and they put the truth into action. Then we spent time looking at each individual component and what makes you up and, and how they're designed to function. And then last week, we talked about the conflict that comes up because there is a conflict that resides here because you and I are stuck here on planet Earth. The moment of your salvation, the Lord did not call you home. He left you here. He's got a job for you to do. It's called good works. It's called being an ambassador, which if that's our next study, by the way. That, we were going to be already studying that before the weeks of uh, 10 weeks ago that event happened. So, you know... Now we're doing this, and we'll get into the ambassadors because we're supposed to be doing something. But what does this guy say? No. It doesn't make me feel good. We were talking about feelings and all this stuff from last time. You're, this guy working backwards, these emotions, sinfully authored emotions, come in and say, no. I don't want to do what you guys decided to do because that doesn't make me feel good. It actually makes me look weak. How many of you have ever gone to a football game or a sporting event, let's say that, and the guys are over in the corner making sure they look tough and you know they, they got everything together? Girls too, by the way, okay? Never do you see them come over and look like Charlie Brown or, or Pigpen from Charlie Brown. They all what? They all got their stuff together. You got 1 Corinthians 15, right? Hold that and go to 2 Corinthians 12. You got to understand something, folks. Your body, your emotions, your, your old sin nature, which is a description of you in your unsaved state, your flesh like does not like to look weak. 2 Corinthians 12, look at verse number 9. Paul here, uh, well, verse 8, For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. Paul had a, a thorn in the flesh in verse 7. Verse 9, the answer to Paul's prayer was, and he said unto me. The answer to Paul's prayer is, what does the Word of God say? That's the answer to your prayers, by the way. What does the Word of God say? So if you're looking for an answer to prayer, what do you need to go do? Find out what the Word of God says about that, and that's going to be your answer. Isn't that interesting? That's easy. You know, anyway, to me. What, is, what did the Lord say to him? My grace is sufficient. For my strength is made perfect in what? 
Greatness? Glory? Honor? No, weakness. When does the grace of God become sufficient? When you're down weak, aren't you? Now your body, these guys, that old sin nature, you know what he says? No. Because what is the law out there of nature? Only the strong survive, right? Do unto others before they do it to you, right? That's the golden rule. It is on the school bus. I'll whack him first before he whacks me. Why? Because the second guy always gets in trouble, doesn't he? Okay? But see, that flesh comes in and says, no, we're, gonna, we're, we're not going to look weak. It doesn't make us feel good. It, it, it hurts my reputation. Now, by the way, notice what the renewed mind will continue to say in verse 9. What Paul's retort back was, Most gladly, therefore, will I, and that's Paul, rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take what? Pleasure, Pleasure in infirmities in reproaches, in necessities, and persecutions, and distress for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I. That's a little different attitude. Boy, you got that attitude, and what does this guy say? No, wait, Jack, we don't like that. We, and then they come over here into you, and they start making these guys go, wait a minute, you know what, that's a good idea. I don't like to look weak. Nobody likes to look weak. We like to look with that presence of strength and vigor and room. Hey, mind, heart, you guys made a wrong decision. We're not going to do that. And the heart said, well, wait a minute. The grace of God, God's suffi- grace is sufficient, and we're, we're, it's okay to be weak. And you know what begins to happen? You begin to have this conflict. And you know what you have? You have an emotional revolt go on in you. And when things are topsy-turvy inside of you, there's a reason. And, and by the way, you have a way of understanding that because the flow's going the wrong way, isn't it? So we reverse the flow back. The heart and the mind, they come in, they say, no, the truth is, the default is what? Faith. And faith says that the grace of God is sufficient, and when I look weak, then I am what? I'm really strong. And they overrule this. Now, in time, These little emotions, they never go away. Galatians 5 is clear. That stuff doesn't go away, but they become a little more subdued. And we looked at that. Now go back to 1 Corinthians 15. We closed here. We ended with verse uh, 1557 because there is a victory program that God does have for you in the conflict. And we just read some of it there You still got 2 Corinthians 12? All right, 1557, let's read this verse. Now, I realize that the context of this verse is resurrection, okay? Because that's what it is. By the way, if you don't believe in the resurrection of Christ, you are all men most miserable, the verse says. Verse 19, if if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all of... We are of all men most miserable. If, we, if, you, if you believe that Christ raised, verse 17, your faith is in vain, ye are yet in your sins. You don't believe in the resurrection. Why? Because what did the resurrection of Christ do? It did what Romans 6 says it did. It crucified your old man. It set you free from sin. Boy, what a great... Think about that concept. Leave that in the back of your mind as we go through here a little bit. So in 1557, he says... But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Where's our victory? Oh, it's in me being strong, Rick. Come on, don't you see that, man? I got to win the day. No, it's where? It's being where? In Christ. Now watch verse 58. Therefore, because we have our victory and who we are in Christ, therefore, remember the therefore, what's the there, therefore? Because of who we are in Christ, because that's where we have victory. My beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Now again, that's a reach back up about resurrection. Because our labor, our work, isn't in vain. It's going to one day pay off in eternity. Godliness is profitable now and in that which is to come, Timothy says. 
See? But it's there, and we have it, and Paul's right here, right now on the earth. Not in 2016, but when he wrote it. <laughs> okay? <laughs> but today, what do we have? We have victory. That's what the verse says. Therefore, my beloved, but thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Come over to 2 Corinthians 2. 2 Corinthians 2 and verse 14. 2 Corinthians 2 and 14. Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ, and maketh manifest the Savior of His knowledge by us in every place. That's an interesting verse about victory. First, you got triumph. Again, where's the tri- why, where is the triumph? It's in Christ. Okay? So you, you're not going to get there in your own ability. You're not going to get there in the energy of your own flesh. you got to get there in the energy of who? Of Jesus Christ. Now, where is He? He's sitting over here in your inner man, isn't he? He's resident in your inner man. He lives. The Godhead dwells in you, Ephesians 4 says. And you know what? There you are. He's right here. And you know what he says? We can beat that guy hands down all the time. And when there's an event that comes up, and I know I get off the screen, but when there's an event that happens over here, good or bad, We can have victory in it because of who we are in Christ. Now let's pray and we'll go home early today. And the fans go out. All right. I had to get you awake somehow by telling you a fib, I guess. Go back there to 2 Corinthians 12. Yeah, I know you are. 2 Corinthians 12. So the issue... By the way, the issue there in 2 Corinthians 2 with Paul in that context there is he, he has no rest in his spirit. You got first, 2 Corinthians 12. Go, just look back there real quick so you understand what's going on. Now, next coming, we're going to talk about Paul and the issue of depression and so forth, and we'll spend some more time. But I want you to notice something. In 2.14, I'm sorry, in 2.14, now thanks be, now, okay, all right, we need, you need both passages. You need 2 and you need 12, okay? Yes, same time. We need 2. Did I, was that confusing? I knew where I was going. <laughs> okay, 212, all right? You're not, we're, we're reading in 212. Yeah, it's just Greg. Yeah. Well, you know what that, well, never mind. Okay, now, 212, right? Now, read the beginning of verse 14. Now, thanks be unto God. You see the now? Go back up to 12. Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, a door was opened unto me of the Lord. I had no rest in my spirit, because I found not Titus my brother, but taking my leave of them, I went from thence into Macedonia. At that moment, Paul's in some turmoil internally. Okay? I asked last time about emailing me some stuff. Some of you did, and that's great, and that's fine, and I'm using it, believe me. But some of it was anxiety. Some of it was this, it was that. Paul is in that situation right there in 12. No rest in my spirit. Now read verse 14. Now, thanks be to who? To God. Okay, I got all this going on. But what am I gonna, what's going to get me out of the funk? Now thanks be to God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ. What got Paul out of the funk? Turning his thinking process over to who? Over to Christ. Now come to chapter 7. We're going to 12. Chapter 7. And watch him do this. And watch what God does to get Paul out of the funk. Two five, uh, seven five. For when we came into Macedonia, now what did 2.13 say? I'm leaving and I'm going to Macedonia. They get to Macedonia. 7.5. Are you with me? For when we came into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. 
Without were fightings, within were what? Oh, look at that. He's got a little anxiety going on, doesn't he? A little anxiousness, a little hesitation, a little fear, a little guilt, a little whatever. Nevertheless, God that comforted those that are cast down. How does Paul view his situation? Cast down, comforted us by the coming of Titus. And not, o- and not by his com- company coming only, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you, when he told us your earnest desire, your mourning, your fervent mind toward me, so that I rejoice the more. Look at what, now go read 2.14. Now, thanks be to God, who, um, which always causes us to triumph in Christ. When Paul says, thanks be to God, who can, causes us to triumph in Christ, how in the world can he say such a thing? What did God do? God comforted him by removing the fear. No. No, 7-7 seven, seven doesn't say that. He comforted us by removing the fightings that were without. How did he comfort him? The end of 6. By the coming of who? By the coming of Titus. Isn't that interesting? God comforted Paul by the showing up of another member of the body of Christ. But when he showed up, what did he do in verse 7? He gave Paul a good report about the Corinthians. Do you see that? So when he showed up, you know what he didn't do? Titus didn't come up and go, here, let me hug you. Love you, missed you. He didn't do that. That wasn't where the comfort was. Where was the comfort in 7-7? When he told us your earnest desire and your mourning. When he gave us a good report from you Corinthians of your love and your desire and your, your, your thinking about me. See that? You see? Isn't that interesting? All the world out there just hug them and love them. No, it's not, that's not what Titus did. Now, I'm sure Titus gave him a hug, don't get me wrong. But that's not what comforted Paul. What comforted Paul was hearing a report about the Corinthians maintaining and staying with the sound doctrine and standing in the doctrine. Why? Because we've been fully equipped to do what? Just that. Whatever comes our way, what are we able to do if we have the doctrine built into us? By the way, if you don't have the doctrine built into you, What can you still do? Go back into the Word of God, right? Get it built in and figure it out and get moving. Guys, there's victory in that. Now go to 12. I'm not even, this is way off the notes. But you need to see this. Because when Paul talks to us about the victory program and triumphing, what is causing it is your understanding of who you are in Christ, understanding the Word of God rightly divided, who you are in Christ, and then applying that to the details of the events. Now look at where we just read a minute ago, verse 9. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. When he said, My grace is sufficient for thee, does a verse come to mind about the sufficiency of grace? Well, you're in chapter 12. Go back to chapter 9. Because if you'd have been reading through, you'd have read 9, 8. Now, 9, 7 and 6 and 7, we're talking about money. We're talking about giving. But look at 9, 8. And who is able to, to do what? To make. Who's doing the making here? God is. How does God work? Through His Word. See that? God is a, and God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. Now, the good work here is, is in the offering box in the back of the room. Okay? So it should be filled up every Sunday. I said that one time, a little girl got the tracks out and filling the tracks in the box. I'm like, honey, that... Yeah, it was the right idea, just wrong paper, <laughs> you know. But no, what does he say? God is able to make what? All. He has equipped you to succeed. 
He's equipped you to handle whatever comes your way. Now go back to 12. So when Paul says in 12, 9, my gra- when, when God says my grace is sufficiency, sufficient, what does Paul know? Yeah, I've been totally equipped to handle anything and everything. I've been equipped to win the conflict. So he says there, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, because my attitude is I'm going to have the power of Christ rest on me, I'm going to focus my thinking, I'm going to focus all of my energy into who I am in Christ and, 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 and get that done, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distress for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. I am become a fool in glorying. Ye have compelled me, for I ought to have been command, commended of you, for in nothing am I behind the chief. And, and off he goes. You know what Paul's saying there? This whole thing here, by the way, he's, he's answering critics in chapter 10, 11, and 12 here. He's answering critics. At the beginning of 2 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul's in distresses, isn't he? Fighting within, fear, fears within, fightings without. God comforted him by the sending of Titus with the good report, with the good word of the Corinthians. At the end of 2 Corinthians, you know what he's done? He's glorying now in all of that. He's had a change of viewpoint. He's had his viewpoint radically adjusted. And the radically adjusting of his viewpoint is back up in verse in chapter 12 there, in verse 2 and 3, when he's caught up into the third heaven. And he's given information that it's not quite time for him to give yet. And you know what he, I'll tell you what I believe, you don't have to agree with this or not, that's up to you. But I believe there when he does this in Acts 14, which is where we're at, when he's left for dead, is that he is seeing the whole package all done. And the information that he's going to be revealed to him later and, and then to us and so forth is that issue of the, the, the doctrine over there in Ephesians of the big picture. And when he sees the big picture and the fact that there's going to be the, ra- the, ra- the, the, the resurrection and us sitting in the heavenly places, and he sees the, the grand plan of God come to fruition, the Father of glory, get the glory. You know what he says? I don't care anymore about my life. Come hell or high water, this is what we're doing. For to me to live is Christ. To, de- to die, yeah, that's gain. That's far better. It's more needful for me to be here in the flesh right now. You know why? Because I got a job to do. And the job that I'm doing is going to be represented over there. And you guys, because you're my epistles, my message and my ministry has been written in your hearts. And you're the guy. And you know what he did? Because he saw the completed picture up there. You know what he said? This life is nothing compared to glory and eternity. Now that's victory. That's what you and I have in Paul's epistles, by the way. Because we can now comprehend what? The breadth, the length, and the depth, and to know. We can, we can get the whole picture, can't we? And we know that just that the issues that are going on right now, just in the moment, don't even compare. Come back to 2 Corinthians 4. Actually, go get 10, 1 Corinthians 10. Folks, you have you and I have been given, we are the only people with the completed Word of God. We have the complete package. We know what God's doing and what He's going to accomplish. So when the events come in and we have all that information stored up into us and we're thinking down through it and the body says, no, we don't want to look weak, we got to look football strong or army strong, or whatever it is, you know what happens? We can sit there and say, default is faith, and no, that's not reality, this is reality. And vote the dude off the island. Follow that? Paul got it because he was taken... By the way, in Acts 14, which is where he's left for dead, you go... I encourage you to go read Acts, starting 14... 
to the end. And watch how Paul changes his attitude about his own safety and his own life. Paul gets up, Acts 14, dusts himself off, turns right around and walks right back into the city that they just stoned him out of. What kind of maniac is that? You and I, we're heading the other way. <laughs> you know, He doesn't do that. He goes in, completely different attitude. He goes to go to Jerusalem. Spirit says, no, don't go. Paul says, I'm going. i got to get down there, the poor saints, blah, blah. Spirit says, that's fine, you go. But man, I tell you what, you're going to get in trouble. I'm just warning you. He goes down there, and what happens to him? Thrown in jail. No big deal. Let's go. Acts 16, we're down there in jail. What are we singing? Happy, happy, happy? No, we're singing, hey, amazing grace. We're singing, how great thou art. The old rugged cross, we're singing the songs and hymns and spirit. And you know what happens? Boom, and then the Philippian jailer says, y'all there? Yeah, we're here. Hey, sir, what do I got to do to get saved? Man, I've been listening to you preaching all week, all week here. He gets saved. Philippian, the church of Philippi, he, Paul could care less about his safety and about his life. But after when? He saw the big picture. It just works out that way. Again, you can agree or disagree. That's your problem. But when you understand what's going on here, Paul had an attitude adjustment. You and I need the same one. 1 Corinthians 10, look at verse 13. A verse we're very familiar with. Chapter 10 sets out a wonderful chap, uh, context, a grouping of chapters of 8, 9, and 10, which is about your liberty and about your freedom in Christ and, and how you can, you can use your liberty for good or you can use it for bad. He starts in 10.1, Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant. And he, again, one of the ignorant brethren statements. Six times he makes that statement. Six times of those, those six statements are six doctrinal facts that you need to have in your life and you need to have in your understanding. And he begins here talking about Israel and the Jews and, and, and his fathers that were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did eat. Verse 6, Now these were our examples to the intent, we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. What's the point in bringing all this back up, Paul? Because when we read that stuff back there, which means you're reading it, by the way, it's there for you to learn something from. So he starts in verse 7, quoting Exodus, verse, verse 8, quoting Numbers 25, verse 9, quoting Numbers 21, verse 10, quoting Numbers 14, verse 11. Now all these things happen unto them for in samples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. You better be careful, because when Israel was doing what Israel was doing, you know what they thought they were doing? They thought they were doing right by God. And they fell flat on their face. See that? Now watch verse 13. Because this is the verse that we all... There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. You see that list in 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10? All that mess back there that Israel fell into? All of that is common to man. That wasn't God testing them. No, I'm sorry, it is God testing them, but it isn't God testing you and I as members of the body of Christ. Therefore hath no temptation taken you, but such as common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able. Wonderful things there. Romans 8, verse number 18, he talks about the suffering of this present time. We live in the dispensation of sufferings. Uh, hold on here, come over to Philippians 1. Folks, when events happen to you today, whether they're good or bad, you know what they are? They are common to man. You are no special deal. There's no special testing for God for you to prove that you love Him or to prove that you don't love Him. They're common to man. But God is able. He's what? He's faithful and He's able, isn't He? Get there in just a second. Look at Philippians 1.29. For unto you 
It is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on Him, but also to suffer for His sake. Having the same conflicts which ye saw in me, this would be Acts 16, and now here to be in me. What's going on? There's some suffering, isn't there? Folks, you suffer three basic areas. Well, first of all, you get old and you die because of the sin-cursed creation. Or you reap what you sow, and then you, yea, all those who live godly shall suffer persecution. I, you look at Philippians 1 there. I tell you what, Peter says it over there in 1 Peter, if you're going to suffer, suffer for Jesus' sake. Suffer for the right reason. Verse 29, For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on Him, but also to what? Suffer, but to suffer for what? His sake. See that? So when you come back over here to 1 Corinthians, on your way, go, go to 1 Thessalonians 3, and verse number 3, 1 Thessalonians 3, 3, that no man should be moved by these afflictions, for yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. That's a reference back to Romans 8, 18 to, the, to about 25 there. 1 Thessalonians 3, 3. Folks, we're appointed to do what? We're appointed to suffer. And when that stuff comes, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, we need to understand that it isn't God sending it our way to make us special. Israel was special. But you and I, no. He's dealing with us differently now. Verse 13, 10, 13, But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able. He's, uh, he's always going to be faithful. Faithful to His Word. And if He says that you're not tempted above that you're able, then guess what? By the way, do you know why you're not tempted above that you're able? Because the temptation is what? Common to man. Okay? Pretty simple, I hope. Actually, people struggle with that. You know why? Because they want a special suffering just for them. Just for them. No. You don't get that. That isn't the deal today. Now watch what happens when the temptation comes. But will with the temptation also make a way to escape? Now that would be great if the period ended there. But the verse doesn't end there, does it? It says that you may be able to bear it. Isn't that interesting? He says, look guys, the stuff's coming. And when the stuff comes, your inner man needs to know it's common to man. Romans 5, because you're justified, you have peace with God. He's not trying to get even, trying to set you up or anything. You're at peace with Him. You need to have in your inner man that norms and standards, that doctrine built down in there that, man, when things come this way and come, and come they do, you know, when it's raining, <laughs> it's pouring, and you need to understand that in that doctrine, in the sufficiency of God's grace, He's made a way for you to bear it. And in the bearing it, you escape it. Follow that? Because when you bear it, what do you begin to do with it? You begin to let it go. You begin to deal with it. You begin to say, you know what? That thing right there, that's what Christ died for at Calvary. And we're going to let it go. Now, come over to 2 Corinthians 1, where we've been in two there for just a minute ago. But I want you to see something here. 2 Corinthians 1, verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Tim Timothy, our brother, under the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints which are in all of Achaia, Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforted us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. Amen, right? We look, we look at that, we rely on that. Let me ask you something. How does God comfort you? The verse says He does, but how does he? Well, hold on here and come over to Romans 15. Glad you asked. <laughs> Romans 15, verse 1. 
Romans 15 and verse number 4. Verse 1, Romans 15, 1. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his, for his good to edification. For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproached thee fell on me. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Where do we get our comfort from? From the Scriptures, right? But it was written for our... Isn't that interesting? you got to learn this stuff. This stuff just doesn't go, there it is. Sprinkle a little tinkle bell dust. No. You got to do what? You got to get in there and study. You don't study, you ain't going to figure it out. But once you study and you put it in there, if you don't go through anything, guess what's going to not happen? It won't come real to you. Come back to 2 Corinthians 1. So God does comfort us, but where does He comfort us? In learning the Scriptures through the Word of God. By the way, that's why right division is so important. Right division is not important so that you know more than the guy you're dealing with next door. By the way, that's pride. Right division is important so you understand where to go get your comfort from. Because if you're trying to get your comfort out of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you're going to fail. If you go back into Genesis to Malachi, you're going to fail. you got to go get your comfort where, you're, where, where he's talking to you, which is right here in 2 Corinthians 1, because now watch verse 5. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring the same sufferings, which we also suffer, or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as ye are partakers of the sufferings, so shall ye be also of the consolations." You know what Paul's saying there? Sum it up for you. Guys, I'm your pattern. And you want to see the comfort of God work in me? How it's supposed to work in you? You need to see how it works in me. How does it work in him? Chapter 2, we've just seen it. We spent a few minutes in it. Chapter 2, what does he say? Man, there's fightings without and fears within. I'm all, I'm all out of sorts. He goes down to Macedonia. Titus shows up. Gives Paul a good word about the Corinthians, right? Then in chapter 12, what does he say? I've had a change of thinking, haven't I? Now the grace of God is sufficient. And now I will take, I would rather glory in my infirmities. See that? Folks, you want to know where your comfort is, where your victory is? You've got to go look at Paul. And I'll tell you what, when Paul lays down about how and where the victory is and where the things are, come back to Romans 8. He's been laying it in since really the very beginning. Where is our victory over sin? Where is it? It's Calvary, isn't it? It's the cross work of Calvary. It's, where, it's, it's, it's Romans 1 to 5, isn't it? Hey, you want to be justified? You want to have your sin debt paid for? you got to go to Calvary. Chapter 6, our identity is in, in that code, death, burial, and resurrection, is in Calvary. And because of resurrection, sin has been taken care of. Sin has been crucified. Sin has been set free. I've been set free from sin. Chapter 7, he comes along and says, not only that, you don't belong to the law. The law is not the right game rules to be playing by. I watched the Cubs play the other night, and the world... and the series, the playoffs, it would have been real funny if they went out there and tried to play that game by football rules. Wouldn't have worked, would it? you got to be in the right game. The right game is grace. The dispensation of grace, not the law. The law is dead. Then chapter 8 comes along and says, okay, you see all that stuff you're dead to? Now you're alive unto God. Chapter 8, look down there at verse 37. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him. Who's the Him? 
Christ. Paul says, man, you want to have the pattern of victory, you need to look to me, and you know where you're going to go look? First place we're going to is Calvary. Because whenever anything happens out over here, good or bad, you better be running to Calvary with it, because that's where Christ paid for it all. Galatians 6. I'm not even on my notes anymore, so, oh well. Folks, the pattern for our victory is in Paul. As he begins to rely on the Word of God to him, who then writes to you and I, Ephesians 3. We understand that process. Galatians 6, verse 14, But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. Where does Paul lay his glory at? He's at the cross. Because at the cross, guess what we begin to do? We begin to see everything that he's done for you and I. Turn the page to Ephesians 1. In verse number 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with how many spiritual blessings? Where? Heavenly places in Christ. All means all, usually. (laughs) Sometimes, I don't know, some of you guys got some weird ideas about all. (laughs) But all spiritual blessings, and you begin to read down through, and we've done it. He's bounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. It's according to His riches and his, of His grace. Where's our wealth sit? It sits in Christ. Colossians 2.10, I am complete in Him, right? Complete, complete. I'm lacking nothing. Nothing's missing. I've got it all there. You know what's missing? Nothing. I just have to go get it. Study it, put it in, because where is it sitting? Sitting out over there, isn't it? Put it in, get her working. Come out over here, get going. Victory. You're in Ephesians, look over in chapter 4. We looked here last time a little bit. We're going to roll up here, finish this up. Ephesians 4 and verse number 23. We looked last time down at verse 17, 18, 19 in that conflict in the believer where he is now walking as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their minds, having their understanding darkened, being alienated, and walking in this ignorance and out their past feeling and so forth. Verse 20, but ye have not so learned Christ. You didn't learn any of that from Christ. You know what you learned from Christ? That he died for all that. See that? He covered that. Verse 21, If so be that ye have heard Him and have been taught by Him as the truth is in Jesus. Have we heard Him? Have we been taught by Him? Yeah, we have. Through who? Through the Apostle Paul. That, what have we, what have we been ta- taught? What have we heard? That ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man which is corrupt according to deceitful lust. There's Romans 6, 6 again. What have we learned? What has Paul told us? Foundational doctrine. Right? And be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. You see that issue about the renewed mind? Does that bring a verse up in your mind? Romans 12, 1 and 2. Go there. Let's look there just real quick. Folks, victory is found in the Word of God. It's demonstrated to you and I in the age of grace through our Apostle Paul as he relies on the Word. So what's... Do you, do you, I hope you see an underlining theme through this. It's the what? It's the Word. What's the default position for you and I? 1 Thessalonians 2.13 The Word of God will work effectually in them that believe. You want the Word to work, you know what you got to do? You just got to believe it. Romans 12 verse 1 I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your... 
reasonable service. Do, do, do you see the reason in there? The Lord tells Israel, come and reason with me. Reason. You know what you're going to do? You're going to sit. You're going to take your mind your thinking capacity and process, and you're going to sit down and you're going to think about, you're going to reason, you're going to logically come up to bring those verses into your understanding <coughs> so that your service will be based on truth and not error. It'll be based on truth, not a feeling. Feelings. Everybody got feelings. Now watch verse 2. And be not conformed to this world. Now we have to live in the world, but we're just not of the world. But be ye transformed. Transformers, more than meets the eye. Transformed by the renewing of your mind. Why do I need to renew my mind? That ye may be able to prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. How do I prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God? I use the Word of God to do it. Romans chapter number 2 brings in Israel in about verse 17-ish there and says, hey, they had the Word of God and they proved the will of God by the Word of God, the law. How do I prove what is the will of God? I have to use Scripture. But notice the renewing of your mind. <clears throat> Second, hold on to Ro Romans 12. And Rucko, well, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 16, it says, The outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. You know how you renew your mind? You have a daily intake of God's Word rightly divided which is designed to bring His life into our life. And you do this by consciously focusing on Him and not yourself. If you're sitting there thinking to yourself, I can, I can defeat this issue or I can beat this sin, and da 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 be, be. no. You know what controlling you right there? Sin is. Romans 6 is clear to whom, if you're going to be servants to sin, you're going to serve sin. If, that's, if your mind, your thinking process is constantly focused in on human viewpoint, you know what's going to run today? Human viewpoint will. But if your mind sits and focuses in on the Word of God rightly divided to you, you know, what you're going to, you know what's going to win the day? That verse will win the day. That, that doctrine wins the day. You know this to be true, I hope. Come over to Colossians chapter 3. There is not a... I'll tell on myself, this past week I drove by a, a, one of my stops in the afternoon. I drove by his house twice. Missed it. You know why? I was thinking about Romans 12. That's the first ride. The ride back I was thinking about 1 Corinthians 15. And I'm driving a bus. And I got kids. And I look up, my monitor, Smitty, he's a nice guy, lost on his way to hell, but he's a nice guy. And he looks up and goes, are you going to drop Max off anytime today? I said, no, probably not. We'll just ride around for a while if that's okay with you. Because I'm over here. <laughs> What's going on? What begins to happen? Now, I got him home. Grandpa wasn't too happy, but I got him home, you know. And I told Grandpa, I said, it's my fault. I'm sorry. I, I own up to it. But what do you begin to do? You begin to think about things, and all of a sudden, those things become second nature to you. You, you got Colossians 3. Look over at Philippians 4. Uh, let Colossians 3. You guys okay? We're good? Cardinals aren't playing today, so we're really good, aren't we? <laughs> look, at, look at Colossians 4. I'm sorry, Philippians 4. My bad. Philippians 4. We'll get, we're off the track again, but that's okay. Philippians 4. Verse number five, let your moderation be known unto all men, the Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So when you're praying, you're just talking to God, right? 
You're, you're, you're thinking, you're talking about God, about the details of life that you're going through and how His Word applies to those details. Right? All right. Pray without ceasing. You better be doing that. You should be doing that. If you're not and you say, well, wait a minute, Rick, I, this detail, I don't quite have verses. Then go study and get the verses in. Call, find, get help. <laughs> get them in there. So you're rolling down the road and you're thinking about life. Now, look at the next verse in Philippians 4. Finally, brethren, whatsoever, whatso, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Do you see that verse just told you what you should be thinking about? Now, I have, in my case with the bus, I got to think about the bus and, you know, all that stuff and, you know, the rules of the road and everything. And I, I spaced it, I, I guarantee you. And we had a great laugh when he still gives me a hard time about it, and that's okay. But the thing is, is what are you thinking about? If I'm thinking about the dirty, rotten so-and-so that cut me off three lights ago and I'm trying to run him down now, then what am I? I'm not thinking about this, am I? then what begins to run the, the situation? Am I going this way or am I going that way? <laughs> is, it, is it A or is it B? <laughs> is it A? How about C? <laughs> you know, the eye chart, okay, the eye exam. Yeah. Some of you got that. Some of you are like, oh. It's... I couldn't read it either. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> now watch verse 9. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do. And the God of peace shall be with you. You know what it is to be a daily intake of your mind? Come over to Colossians 3 now. It's to be the Word of God, rightly divided. And when it begins to do that, you know what it begins to do? It begins to take over. And it begins to control how your reaction is to things that come up in life. Do you realize, you got Colossians 3? I need 1 and 2, but look down at verse number 19. 319. Husbands, love your wives, and be not bitter against them. By the way, this goes for husbands and wives, okay? You see that issue of bitterness and the root of bitterness? Do you know where bitterness comes from? It comes from a lack of forgiveness. Look back up at 3.13. Forbearing one another and what? Forgiving one another. You can, you know what forbear is? Just put up with it. Let it go. Keep it, you know. But usually what happens to that? You, you, it builds up in you, doesn't it? You get in the shower and you're taking a shower and, you know, hu husband or honey is gone and, or maybe not, maybe downstairs getting the, whatever in the other room. And you're sitting there, you know what? Next time she says that to me, I'm just going to send her in the next week. I can do it. Mom's done it. I can do it. Next time he says that to me, I'm just going to come off on him. I'm going to uncork all of it. That's not healthy. Because that's forbearance without forgiveness. And it begins to, gender, and begins to build bitterness. Resentment. But what does the book say? It says forbear and... Forgive. So you, now you're in the shower or you're uh, whatever, and you say, you know what? He said that to me, and that was just awful, and it hurt. But we're going to talk about it. But when we talk about it, we're going to talk about it in a tone of civility and not anger and bitterness, see? A completely different way to think about it. Colossians 3, verse 1. A daily intake of the Word of God rightly divided. It will change your perspective. And it will give you the victory over everything that comes up in life. You have the potential to have victory in. You just have to trust. Default for the believer is faith. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. Where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God, set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. 
You're to seek in the set. When you seek something, you know what you make. A, you know what you're doing. You're making a conscience effort to find something. You're focused in on it. Have you ever done that? I got to find this. At home. That's what you need to do. You're renewed. You renew your mind by seeking the things that are above. You renew your mind when you set down and you make the conscience effort to find out about the things that are above. And you set your mind to thinking about that. And if you can do that, you will not have uh, you you won't have to worry about forgetting the other stuff out there because you can't think about two things at the same time. And if you're thinking about truth, you know what error is going to do? Error is going to argue and not like it. But error is also going to then be put in its place because what did you decide to do? Operate by faith. Follow that? When you seek and you set your mind to it and you say, you know what, I got an issue with bitterness or I got an issue with anger and I got an issue with wrath or whatever the issue is and I got to find, what does God's Word say about it? By the way, you know what it says? You're set free from it. It's been at Calvary. It's been crucified. It's been done. Don't you know who you are in Christ? I think God sometimes, and I know He doesn't do this, but if I was Him, I would. You know, what are these people, idiots? I've told them over and over again that it's done. You know, they're blockheads down. Because what does He do? It's, it's done. And when you begin to understand and set your, and seek that information out, error will argue but faith will say, we're going to follow the truth. Then he says, set your affections. Set. Once you find the truth, now you're going you're gonna to set. Now you're going to tune your radio into that. And you're not going to change the station. One more passage and we'll be done. Isaiah 34. There's just a piece of a verse in Isaiah 34. Folks, the key to victory, by the way, is faith, believing the Word of God. Isaiah 34, verse 6. We're to fix our thinking on Paul. We're to set. We're to fix our thinking on who we are in Christ. And that's where the victory is. Look at Isaiah 34, verse 6, the beginning of the verse. Well, that's not the verse. Oh, man. Well, that stinks. Well, it, ta it talks about seeking the book of the Lord and reading. 16. 34, 16. Okay. Whew. Scared me there. 34, 16. Seek ye out the book of the Lord and and read. Isn't that interesting? Paul tells Timothy, till I come, give attendance to reading. What happens when you read? It, headache. It gets into you, doesn't it? And the next thing you know, you know what you're doing? You're, you're, you got stuff flowing through your mind about, hey, you know what? That verse over there says I shouldn't really be doing this. That verse says I should be doing that. That verse says this should be my attitude over here. Wherefore, put away. Mortify your members. Do this, do that. Don't do that. You know what? It's real clear through Paul that when we set our minds and we seek our minds out and we operate on faith, then guess what happens? We have victory. We have success. And if I could just say to you the key to victory... Your, you, let me say it like this. Your desire for victory in your life would be the greatest motivator for you to study the Word of God rightly divided. Because you know what Paul says? Paul said, God said unto me, His Word to me, was that His grace is sufficient. So my newfound attitude about life is going to be, His grace is sufficient. And no matter what I got to go through and deal with and put up with, and you guys or myself, the victory is going to be found over there in who I am in Christ. So you know what I need to do? 
I need to know who I am in Christ, so what do I need to do? I need to go study. So if I want to have victory, and by the way, you have it. You have all sufficiency, all the blessings. You've got everything. You just have to do what? <laughs> Let's go study, bring it into the thinking capacity, and move on over. You follow all that? So can we have victory? Yes, we can. It gives stability, it brings peace, it gives all this in life, but it starts with the studying of the Word of God, rightly divided. And the key to then bringing that victory into your life lies really going back over there and figuring out, this is who I am, this is what He's done for me, and I'm going to go live in that. And to live anywhere else is to live beneath my station in life. My dad always said, I have caviar dreams on McDonald money. That's the idea. We're up here. We need to be living where we're supposed to be living. Okay? All right. Dearly Father, we thank you for the morning, Lord. We thank you for your word. And Lord, we thank you for the truth that's in your word for us today so that we can have victory in the details of life, to bring honor and to bring glory to you. In your name we pray.